hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Blue, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you experience technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please dial 1-866-779-3239, or you can message the WebEx producer using the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode, and as a reminder, this event is being recorded. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. We encourage you to su submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Also keep the drop down as all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your speaker for today, Mandy Sedlak, Food Safety and Public Health Manager, EcoSure, a division of Ecolab. Mandy, you now have the floor. Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining for the presentation Beyond Food Safety. I'm Mandy Sedlak, and I will be presenting today. On the presentation outcomes, we will review the global burden of foodborne illness and the top CDC and FDA foodborne illness respecters. We will also review an opportunity and benefits and outcomes for food service operators during today's trends and environment. We will also learn the knowledge and trends of their impact on food safety and food operations and best practices to improve guest experience and protect your guests, the community, and your brand. The illness implications of poor food safety practices are listed. The consequences of poor food safety practices and behaviors affect lives every day. Every year, foodborne disease causes almost one in 10 people to fall ill. 33 million healthy lives are lost and 420,000 deaths per year. Foodborne disease can be deadly, especially in children less than five years old or under five. Children, unfortunately, account for almost one-third of deaths from foodborne diseases. The CDC has listed contributing risk factors to foodborne illness in North America. The first risk factor is improper holding at 27%. Poor personal hygiene at 25%, and we would see that as improper hand washing. Um, unsafe sources are at 15% with inadequate cooking at 14%. We see these as foundational risks to prevent foodborne illness. The FDA also completed a study. The FDA pre uh, previously conducted this. It was a 10-year study between 1998 and 2008. Uh, they uh, measured the trends and the occurrence of foodborne illness risk factors and food safety behaviors and practices. The study consisted of three data collections, so the years of 1998, 2003, and 2008. They summarized their findings, and data from these periods were all analyzed to detect trends over time. What we see is there are many segments of the retail food industry that continue to re require improvement in critical areas. There needs to be and gain better control over food safety behaviors and practices of employee hand washing and cold holding of foods requiring refrigeration. From the last slide, we see that the risk factors match and they tell the same story. We need controls for hand washing and cold holding, which would also be included in their SOPs that are effective, proper and effective training, execution of hand washing and cold holding, proper execution, monitoring, and corrective action. Food safety practices and behaviors can impact other areas of your restaurant as well. Not only are temperature control and personal hygiene a vital component, component of preventing foodborne illness, but so is that it's, it's essential to, to a great guest experience. Other areas that could be affected are food quality. This can come from not having foods hot or cold foods cold. Food waste from unlabeled or unmarked foods efficiencies, uh, guest experience, which could include sanitation and disinfection, and guest counts. 
This could be affected by overall food, service, and the atmosphere. Social media is now a huge part of our society with virtual feedback. It's common that people share all of these experiences online through social media channels. Beyond a food safety, we, re we view food safety as a potential um, safety issue, which we should, but from a customer or guest perspective, we need to think about these areas through a different lens. This bird's eye view shows a restaurant and we see the front of the house and the heart of the house sections. If we look at the front of the house and we look specifically at the bar at the far left upper corner, we know that when we're looking at the bar from a food safety perspective, we would want to ensure that no bare hand contact um, with ready to eat foods. Overall sanitation, which includes great sanitation of drains to uh, prevent pest uh, attraction. But other areas that could be affected in that are the guest experience. Guests don't want to see pests running around in the bar or see anybody uh, handling ready to eat foods. That guest experience also affects uh, profits. The more guests that are coming through the door, the more profits we see. The lobby, we want to look at the exterior of the lobby. Um, the exterior um, of, the, of the parking lot. When we come inside, both the dining room, the lobby, and the bathroom have a guest touch points that we would want to make sure that we disinfect. If we're not disinfecting and making sure that we're killing those germs, such as germs that would cause norovirus, make someone ill from a door handle, that's also going to affect their guest experience. We move to the lower right-hand corner where we see the heart of the house. If we start um, at receiving, we look at approved sources, um, sanitation of the exterior and the back door, the garbage area, extra equipment, and sometimes we see it cluttered. This affects the guest experience. Uh, food safety and production, we see rotation issues, hot and cold hold temps as a food safety concern, but quality, waste, profits and guest experience can also be affected with that, including no employees working ill, uh, which also affects food safety and guest satisfaction. Improved food safety systems have proven operational results beyond the protection of food safety. Uh, we've seen a reduction of set in critical findings by 70% decreased costs coming through 34% less health department findings and 19% in lower turnover, also increased guest satisfaction, 53% fewer guest complaints in top units and 1.8, almost 2% revenue increase. Again, having proven SOPs, effective training, proper execution and oversight, as well as critical and corrective action can help you achieve these proven results beyond food safety. High-level market forces also impact food safety. We look at society and trends, the current environment, sustainability, legal regulations, and available technology, and as we know, all of its uses. There are increasing consumer demands. These relate back to the high-level forces that affect food safety, people, guests, Consumers and communities are asking, is it safe? Where did it come from? Is it sustainable? And most recently, can it be delivered? So with that, we'll dive into trends and specifically convenience and talk about how that is affecting your business. People are repurposing their time. Guests and consumers um, find that uh, millennials are the priority audience for food delivery services as they spend the highest share of their budgets on prepared food compared to other generations. 63% of Americans abandon digital takeout order orders if they have a poor customer experience. And 55% of U.S. adults want an easier online ordering system, given that Food delivery platforms should greatly simplify ordering and allow customers to place orders through possible channels such as social media, virtual assistants, smart devices, cars, and so on. And we see in that guest experience increased profits, guest satisfaction, and brand protection included. 
By 2023, restaurant delivery is projected to grow more than three times the rate of on-premises sales, with the majority going to digital orders. More than 50% of consumers order directly from the restaurant's app or website. And the key segments are high-income households and millennials. In 2020, 70% of customers will order food off-premise. Food delivery adds new food safety concerns, but also operational challenges such as uh, security concerns and uh, heart of the house and front of the house concerns. There are increased orders through phone or POS systems, additional pressures on cooking lines, production, assembly, and orders and receiving, increased volume on the line, a restaurant is made to handle so many orders on the line, not including those that are continuing to come in time over time increasing. Additional space is needed for storage, hot food, cold food, or even room for temperature and time control out in the lobby area staging before deliveries are picked up. New food packaging considerations are a main point. We'll get into this further, but it definitely affects food quality and food security. We also have possible additional partnerships to manage with food delivery, contracts, delivery positions. But overall, we continue to talk about maintaining foundational food safety practices because we know that they also affect other areas of operations. Personal hygiene, proper time, temperature control and holding, Cooking, cooling, reheating, and approved sources are all included in that. Foodborne illness risk factors, when not executed correctly, can lead to a foodborne illness. And qualities such as hot and cold holding affects products, guest experience, and in turn profits. So what can we do? How do we improve and make sure that we're ensuring foundational food safety and protecting brand reputation? ensuring guest satisfaction, and increasing profitability. With cooked foods, orders must be cooked and held at the recommended temperatures to kill pathogens. Do not rush orders without checking the final cooked temperatures. Holding hot food should be held greater than 135 degrees Fahrenheit, and cold foods should be held less than 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Production, line, assembly, and staging hot and cold holding equipment must be functioning properly. Cooling, it's advised to cool food in shallow pans to less than 70 degrees within two hours and less than 40 deg 41 degrees with an additional four hours. It is imperative that you do not keep food in the danger zone for a time longer than six hours total. Maintaining a depth of three inches or less in the shallow pans is optimal for cooling. We also move to reheating. Again, foundational poor execution can make someone sick and reduce guest counts. Always reheat products to 165 degrees within two hours. The timing and the temperature of this process is of utmost importance. Again, keeping food out of that danger zone for less amounts of time. Monitor and document the process, moving through the danger zone quickly. We know that the danger zone is inside of there, 42 to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. Guest counts can be unpredictable and running short on products can result in purchases from unapproved sources. Brand standards, food quality, and food safety can be compromised. Develop an approved vendor list, and if substitutions are allowed, communicate guidance on approved secondary sources. Personal hygiene, as we saw, number two on the foodborne illness risk factors, and also an important risk factor found by the FDA. It remains important for everyone involved in the delivery process. Food handlers should not work with symptoms of vomiting or diarrhea. Having all hands on deck is important to an efficient operation. However, allowing an Ill employee or food handler to work is a very risky practice. It shouldn't be prioritized out of fear 
that operations would run short-staffed or need to fulfill hours for pay. Other areas can be worked on to improve those areas and make efficiency run smoothly. Food handlers should not work with symptoms, as we talked about, of vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, you should develop and maintain an ill employee policy, which includes training and a log to track employee call-offs. Manage the date employees return to work. Food handlers is advised that they should not work until they are symptom-free for 24 hours. That's what we do. And why do people not wash their hands? So studies have identified barriers to hand washing, such as too busy, hand sinks out of sight, soap and paper towels are just not available. Sometimes wearing gloves can create a false sense of security. We put on gloves thinking that we're not going to move pathogens or physical contamination, chemical contamination to anything else, which is not true. As we're wearing the gloves, we can be touching other surfaces and then contaminate ready-to-eat foods. Hand hygiene may not be considered a priority, and the connection between hand hygiene and foodborne illness is just not understood. We've spoken about it as we go through, but proven systems and procedures are needed. Effective training, active monitoring, consistent execution, as well as corrective action. In this world of deskless workers, how do we train effectively in a shorter amount of time? Next, we have a great example of a lesson that can teach the importance of hand washing without saying a word. We're just going to wait for the other slides to come up, and then we're ready to go. That video can be very impactful in a short amount of time. The impact of training on your business can be significant. We see improved operations, 18% increase in service standard score, 15% reduction in food waste, and decreased costs, 40% of employee turnover reduced, 60% reduced training seat time, increased profits and guest satisfaction. We've seen a 16-point increase in intent to return and 22% increase in product sales. Hmm. One second here while we there we go. There are the delivery con uh, considerations as well. Packaging it sets the tone of the guest's dining experience upon delivery. 
It should touch on three areas. These will all affect not only food safety, food security, and food quality. Seal the bags and beverages. We see that we should use tamper-resistant seals. They can be used. Ensure the seals are secure and they cannot be compromised. Also, don't forget to double-check everything first so you don't have to open up the tamper-resistant seals and compromise the security. Consider different packaging or double bagging for delivery. Technology uh, may have more of an impact on delivery. And is packaging where it needs to be right now? We're not sure, but we think that will it, it will evolve over time to help improve that food safety experience, food security, and food quality. We also talk about holding. Maintaining hot and cold temperatures as long as possible is important during delivery for the quality. Some of the um, opportunities and areas to work on are the time from cook to assemble to staging and pickup should have minimal lag times. Package hot foods and cold foods in separate containers. Stage food in hot or cold holding units whenever possible, and if that's not possible, a solution would be to monitor time and temperature of products held at room temperature through labeling or timestamps. There are other considerations. This may be the time to educate the consumer. It really is your only point of contact from your brand to them after the food leaves the restaurant. Consider additional information on the seal. Examples are documenting the time the meal was prepared, packaged, and picked up. You also want to um, include further instructions such as heating or reheating instructions to make your guests feel comfortable even though they're not in the restaurant. Other documentation you could add is new delivery considerations to, do, to daily shift and line checks, uh, documenting, documenting the staging and pickup times, also considering delivery drivers, hand washing, and packaging. Most of all, listen to your table free guests. They're calling and saying that they have concerns. Make sure you prioritize them and, and address them. We also see a food service sustainability trend that affects operations through food safety and other ways. Food waste reduction, organics, compost, and composting. Composting can include food scraps, food soiled paper, as well as green waste. Recycling, things that are currently being recycled are cooking oil, uh, grease trap oil, cardboard boxes, glass, and last of all, donations. We're seeing how you can nourish the community uh, that may have food insecurity. One third of all food produced in the world is being wasted. Through this Arizona uh, University research, we see that full service restaurants waste 11.3% of their food. Quick service restaurants waste 9.5% of their food. With food waste at 21% total um, in municipal land fills, uh, we see that saving waste could increase profits and reducing it can also increase guest counts, especially with consumers that highly value sustainability. The average benefit cost ratio for food waste reduction was seven to one over a three year time frame. Solutions are key in that. Within the first year of implementing a food waste reduction program, 76% of the sites had recouped their investment. Within two years, 89% had recouped their investment. So by reducing the food waste, the average site saved more than two cents on every dollar of cost of goods sold. This ensured guest satisfaction, increases profit, profitability, and reduces food waste. The NRA also report reported that they found guests can be influenced by a restaurant's sustainability practices. Many operators engage in recycling, and with about half of customers factoring in a restaurant's recycling and food donation program, as well as reducing food waste, we look at that is what consumers are experiencing and taking into consideration when they're choosing where to dine. Other solution considerations, how do we how do we stop waste in the restaurant and reduce it? Pre-consumer waste, so food that doesn't leave the kitchen. 
evaluate the inventory, package, and storage, possibly offer staff meals, and as we'll talk about sooner, consider donating food. Post-consumer waste, food that's purchased by a customer but not eaten, encourage guests to take their food home with them, disposables, paper goods, plastic utensils, and packaging, consider using compostable products, set up systems for recycling and composting. Proper recycle and compost containers and placement. It's important to source the right containers with effective closures. They should be large enough to keep up with volume, prevent storing anything outside of the containers, and set up regular cleaning of storage areas. Schedule pickups to keep up with volume. Keep containers locked or covered to reduce, reduce owner, odors and prevent pest entry. There are many positive outcomes to sustainability, recycling, organics, and um, donations. One of the positive outcomes of sustainability is nutrient-rich soil. You can turn organics into compost to have a more nutrient-rich soil can divert and minimize landfill waste and preserve the environment. It also has a positive effect on the community's livelihood. There are also challenges with it. New equipment and tools. Additional space needs. Possible sanitation and odor concerns and pest attractions. The time that it takes to do it. New vendor partnerships and the need for those foundational food safety systems are a must. All of those challenges can be overcome with proper planning as the positive outcomes outweigh the challenges. There are specific considerations with food donations as well. Food donations may nourish a community with food insecurity and as a positive community support and it's a great partnership, but there are considerations beyond, such as foundational food safety practices. We talked about the CDC and FDA risk factors, proper date marking and labeling, preparation for donation within rotation, proper finished product labeling, proper packaging, and storage for pickup. If product can be, it should be considered to be frozen. Add new processes into existing documentation whenever possible. Additional cooking, cooling, staging, and storage checks, and donation and pickup logs can be added. When you are donating to a susceptible population, it's important to have those foundational food safety practices and possibly different systems in place to make sure that they're executed properly. Again, standard operating procedures for food donations alone what can be donated, how it should be cooked, when it should be cooked, food should not be cooked when it's out of rotation, and uh, what, how it is handled and how it is um, handled right before it's picked up, such as freezing. So when we look at everything we just spoke about in the restaurant, there are so many areas that are affected by food safety and can cause illness within consumers and guests. Beyond food safety, you can increase profitability, reduce waste, ensure guest and employee safety, ensure guest satisfaction, and protect brand reputation. Food safety benefits are multifold. Train employees properly to execute foundation food safety practices. Keep up with key trends that not only affect food safety, but are just plain old good business. Be flexible and open to different solutions and use best practices to fit your operations. Protect your guests, the community, and your brand. We will go ahead and open up for questions if anybody has any. Please go ahead and enter them into the question category area. Great. Thanks, Mandy. We do have a, a few questions. Um, while we wait for some additional ones to come in, we can start with these that have already come in. Um, Great. You talked 
You talked about the impact of training and you shared some really impactful um, data points. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, how the data was collected, um, and really just elaborate on the importance of, of that for people in, in selling training to their, their higher ups? Sure, sure. Um, we, there are multiple ways to measure the effects of training. One would be turnover, um, and although training isn't the only component of turnover, it's definitely um, one category. What we really see and what I've learned from others as we completed the data or looked for the data is training to results is key. You can't just train to train. So it's important to be able to measure how people are being trained. In order to do that, you have to have a system in place, the SOPs. You have to have proper execution. And people need to know the proper training techniques. They need to know, for example, let's talk about hand washing. They need to know how to wash their hands. Um, they need to know when to wash their hands. And beyond that, we need to follow up and ensure people are washing their hands, so monitoring that as well. And measuring how people wash their hands after that's done is a huge indication of how the training worked. And if the training isn't working, it needs to be done again. Now, as far as selling it to higher ups, I would say that the CDC respectors and the FDA respectors, having personal hygiene in the top 25% of causes to foodborne illness is a pretty good and significant number to show that training is needed. And again, if we look at training as needed, uh, because if it wasn't, they wouldn't be in the top 25%, then we also look at how do we effectively train. And if it's not working in our restaurants, if we're still getting um, deficiencies on health departments from hand washing, if we still see the risk when we're in the restaurants of people not using tongs touching ready to eat with bare hands, not washing their hands correctly before they put on gloves. Any of those areas um, can reduce, it can, it can result in a foodborne illness. So those two things would be key, um, making sure that we have that sound science showing um, that not washing your hands um, is not something to be taken lightly, as well as Make sure that the training that's currently happening is effective within your restaurant through different key performance indicators that you have on hand. Great, thank you. Are there, just to continue on that path slightly, we've got a couple more questions. Um, are there ways to measure the effectiveness of training like before, before, um, before the training or, or ways that you can test the effectiveness versus out after it's been done? Yeah, I mean, the testing is definitely a one way to measure it before it's done, but you can also use those key performance, um, so, or, the tools that you have in the restaurants to monitor how you're doing, whether you're monitoring your profits and losses, your P&L, or whether you're monitoring uh, risk in the restaurant, such as um, workers' comp or other financial situations, um, there are ways that you can um, make sure that you're, you're um, looking into these beforehand, um, such as health inspections. How are you doing on health inspections? How many hand washing violations have you had on your health inspection? And is that an area where you need to train? And once you train, did it improve? So not only just the tests that they take afterwards and monitoring them afterwards, but also, also health inspections. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about a few specific um, products, um, milk and milk products. Do you have some yes. advice on handling these in this context? Sure. As we relate milk, I suppose back to food safety and breaking into quality concerns, uh, first thing that comes to mind is cold holding. So making sure that not only it's received from an approved source, um, but also that it's held cold, which would be similar to all other uh, TCS foods that need to be held at 41 degrees or below. 
Milk may bring another area of allergens um, into light. With allergens, just such a concern in restaurants every day and in food service with our consumers, um, we want to make sure that if anyone has any um, intolerances uh, to dairy, um, that that's not taken lightly. But besides all other food safety foundational practices, they would all remain the same. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have about one more question. Um, do you have any examples on um, how donating product can affect day-to-day -day operators, or can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, when you donate products, it's essential to set yourself up for success with a great partner. And just doing that alone um, can really set the tone for how the process moves going forward because you would schedule pickups. Um, donating food um, affects storage. And some of the areas in operation would affect where you're storing products. It also affects a time in the restaurant. You would need to make sure that you're taking that extra time to cook products off at the end of the night. Cool it properly at the proper hierarchy within the walk-in cooler, which again, it would affect storage. Proper cooling, reheating if needed. And then also storage in the freezer if needed. And before you freeze it, before pickup, you need to make sure that you're weighing and documenting. So a lot of areas and operations are affected but it's a positive community experience. And you find that when people are taking these extra steps to execute food donations, uh, that they're also, they're also noticing the positive effects it could have on the community. Uh, but when you're doing all that, it's important, again, to monitor and have some kind of ways to um, measure how you're doing. So, assessments come into play there, as well as everything else in food safety or foundational, just monitoring and making sure you're consistently assessing how you're doing and um, taking into consideration corrective action that needs to be taken. Great. Thank you. It looks like we just had one more question come in. How can restaurants be sure that Time as a control is being upheld for delivery orders. Hmm. Any advice on that, Keith? That's a really good question. So delivery as it evolves, and uh, we look at we look at technology probably coming or not probably, but definitely coming more into play in the future. And I'm not sure if that will have something to do with it or not, but. I think it's most important to execute the time and temperature control in your own four walls, first of all. So making sure that you're not staging things far too early before they're picked up. When we talk about time as a temperature control, um, probably around four hours by the time it gets to a certain temperature on the high end and the low end, so there's a buffer there, but four hours is what you want. Uh, to keep food um, in the danger of zone as long that's as long as possible you want to keep it there so having a two hour window of when it's staged to where we expect it to be dropped off of the guest is a good goal so staging it at an appropriate time not letting it sit out too long labels would come into play not only from the restaurant's point of view to know when it was staged or made but also the guests the guest, the final guest that it's delivered to can see that time and that, not necessarily the temperature, you know the temperature, but the time of when it's delivered. Um, so if there are questions that come through or there are um, significant time um, differences from the guests, most likely they would call in. But again, um, right now it's rather um, slow with the labels and such and just having that good connection and being open to guests calling in, but um, really the labeling and time stamping is key. If you wanted to monitor um, that to look for opportunities, it would also be an area where you could do some sort of mystery shopping to see what's going on um, from the consumer's end might also be a possibility. 
Great. Is there any government approval or um, help public health control aspect to this, to the time control? Yes, yes. Um, the food code states that time as a public health control can be used, and there are different, uh, there are two different sections of that, and depending on the temperatures of the product for cold and hot holding, but the main uh, regulation is that once a product that is hot reaches a temperature of 135 degrees, so if it was cooked to 165, and it's reduced to 135. Once it gets down to that 134, it must be labeled. It has four hours to be in that window before it can either be consumed or discarded or cooled to less than 41 degrees. Same with the cold temperatures coming up, uh, the main uh, four-hour time frame. And uh, like I said, there are some exceptions if the temperatures remain below 70, uh, but the main um, goal there is to keep product below 41 degrees for as long as possible, and once it moves up to 42, either consuming it, discarding it, or um, uh, keeping it in a cold area or reheating it uh, within that four hours. Great. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Oh. And I also wanted to add, I know that I just had a webinar um, in October and I had many, many requests for the video. So just to know that that video is available and I will post it on a LinkedIn account so anybody who would like to view that, that video or forward it on will have access to it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, if that's it, I really, really thank you for joining us at Ecolab today as we work together to and partner to improve food safety and, as we saw today, even beyond that, operations, um, profits, and guest satisfaction, and really to get those guests through the door uh, to be able to have that opportunity to uh, delight them uh, with safe food. Have a wonderful day, and thanks again for joining. Maybe, maybe one second real quick, just and we wanted to also let all of the attendees know to um, visit our website for the presentation and also a link to the video that, that was played. Thanks. Do you have a slide that you want to put up with anything of that nature? No, we're good. Good. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Um, as we said, there will be a recording after December 12th on Ecolab.com. And we welcome any feedback and watch your inbox for future webinar details. We do webinars quarterly and we would love to have you join us in 2020. Thank you. And don't forget, as we said, please complete the survey following the webinar and that's where you can request your continuing education certificate. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's event. Thank you for attending. You may now disconnect your lines and have a great day.